Interesting. Yeah, I just activate my connection. One sec. We'll see if the Wi-Fi goes down during your talk. <laughs> <laughs> right, so how many people have used more than um, eight cores in their system? Hands up. So everyone's used uh, eight core servers or workstations or eight threads? Okay, so um, uh, my talk is about how you actually break that limit and how, how you actually have more cores than a, a single server. So I work in a company um, who develops a custom interconnect uh, for doing this. So what if you had an application that, that uh, consumed a lot of memory? Uh, what if you had more data than you can fit in, in one server's uh, memory capacity or, or more data than you can put it on drives in that server, then you need something which is bigger. So how do you, actually how does um, the world solve this? So um, what you do is, is you develop um, some custom silicon, which I'll talk about in a minute. <coughs> First of all, um, what do you actually benefit from having a really large server that has perhaps thousands of cores um, and, and simply one OS, one Linux instance? Well, it's easy, easier to manage. You only have one system. You also have, um, uh, you share all the resources. So you can have uh, one RAID array and all the, the data on your, your storage. This is done um, in storage area networks, but you can do it locally. So, and um, if you want to run large uh, applications which crunch a lot of data, simply you don't need to modify them. They'll just work with all of the cores. Linux will just give the applications more cores, uh, more memory, more disk. So that work, more GPUs as well. So, how how do you do this from from an, an architectural point of view? Well, simply. In a, on a, um, each uh, CPU, you need to program uh, the memory routing tables so that, that memory outside the kind of local server, if you have a rack of servers, memory outside this server goes via one, one chip. And then by doing so, you can, you can have basically, not infinite, but pretty large address space. So um, in this case, um, you can also connect them, in, you can interconnect them in, a, in such a way where you have uh, one hop between each, each island, as it's called, um, for each uh, server. And, and, and you have uh, a chip which actually acts as a, uh, basically, a router. Kind of like how, how IP routing works with the internet. So that's, that's what's needed for these things. So you can extend that beyond uh, a simple 2D network into a 3D network like this. And you can, you can have such a large uh, cache coherent system, each of these squares being a, a, a server in a rack. So you can have really, in this case, uh, 3 by 4 by 4. Yeah. Now, to do that, though, you need, you need um, lots of ports in your, your cache coherent interconnect. This is our, uh, one of our older ones here that has six ports. Um, each, each port, uh, you put in a pair of cables, and, and you have uh, bidirectional communication in X, Y, and Z axes. Um, in this particular chip, which is uh, custom silicon uh, uh, designed for this, you have about uh, 1,600 nanoseconds round trip which is, s sounds fast, but actually is, is so much slower than the, the CPUs themselves. So there's also scale, uh, scaling issues with how software operates as well, and also how you, you optimize the software uh, to run fast. Now, um, on these systems, so both uh, silicon graphics and on uh, these numerous scale systems, which many of our customers use, they all run Linux. So actually, Linux 
uh, single-handedly is the OS of choice. Windows doesn't go beyond, I think, 16 sockets these days, or th maybe 32. So how does one add support in, in Linux for, for thousands of, 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 of uh, cores? The x86, uh, x86 architecture has eight bits um, for each core to address each core, uh, which has a unique APIC ID for, for handling interrupts. So, um, invariably, you can add a, a software mechanism to extend this and to, to allow um, breaking through that barrier of eight bits. So, by um, so uh, the, the uh, uh, kernel supports 32 bits um, interrupt, in, uh, interrupt space, so you can then structure that into x, y, and z axes, uh, like three or four bits per per kind of um, position on each of those axes, and then um, eight bits for the local motherboard. <coughs> This shows how, how interrupts basically uh, root from, from, one, uh, pro from one core to a different, um, a different motherboard. So in order to use this new, new mechanism, which, um, which I'll show you later how it was introduced for, for um, using more than two, uh, 255 cores, you, you then have to um, have, have custom hardware that responds to interrupt uh, writes in memory, which can then emulate how interrupts work, and then forward them over the, this cache coherent fabric to the, the remote server and then generate what is actually um, an interrupt. So we have, um, in order to achieve this, um, the I, uh, uh, you have to write a kernel driver that then maps into the system address map. So the local APIC um, is, is what's normally used for generating interrupts. And this, um, there's actually a, an additional area which um, here, uh, let's see, interrupt controller, which we map underneath that, which decodes to our, our special silicon chip. So instead of writing to local, local, a local APIC, we generate a write to our interrupt controller with our specific driver for, for our chip, which then supports the Linux's 32-bit interrupt space. And then that's rooted and ends up being an interrupt um, on the remote server. Yeah, so um, these are the areas here, like the, the DRAM areas here, these are all cache coherent. So these are mapped into the other, other PCI bars. Um, I don't show different PCI bars, but they, these are all uh, distributed and mapped across different servers. So you literally just, when firmware is configuring this, uh, booting your rack of servers as one system, it's, it maps all of the, the DRAM in, of different servers into the address space, into like one global address space. And um, you have up to uh, uh, Linux supports um, 32 terabytes, or uh, yeah, and uh, for coherent memory and 64 terabytes for non-coherent. Okay, so this this is the Linux kernel driver which supports our our custom silicon for booting more than. Uh, 200, uh, 255 cores, and in essence, it's very, very simple. You you declare a struct at the top, which then shows you what um, it registers a function to then call when there is a, when Linux wants to interrupt a different core. Uh, this function here, down here, basically looks up the. Um, the 32-bit Linux uh, APIC ID, the, the, the ID of the core. And then it, it actually it, it looks at the structure of it. Um, you can igno ignore this area here. Simply, it then does a Numenchip APIC write, which writes the 32-bit words into this memory mapped area, and which, which then generates an interrupt 
across the fabric to um, a remote core. So this, is, this illustrates just how easy it is to write a kernel driver and how simple it is. It's, it's minimal and, and simple. There's a few more lines, but it's not the, the core. This is the core of the code. Interestingly, this, this area here is a, uh, an, an uh, optimization where if you're interrupting a core on the same server, don't go via our chip, but simply go via the core itself. So generate a local interrupt. So that's, that's the normal Linux um, interrupt mechanism, which writes to, to this um, local APIC space here. And that's uh, decoded by the processor, and then it generates a certain cycle type on the, the processor interconnect. So if you have a rack of servers, um, the motherboards have different uh, clock chips, clock crystals. So the actual time runs slightly differently, like maybe um, less than 0.01%. But over time, it adds up. And, um, and of course, time isn't synchronized. So you need some mechanism to have a global clock, which the kernel scheduler and applications can use that isn't going to drift. So in order to do so, we have a, a, a timer register. Uh, and this is mapped here. Um, global timer, right, and uh, local timers. So global timer is, is something that is simply a counter that is incrementing on all these, these um, uh, cache coherent chips on all the servers, and it's, it's, it's all synchronized, whereas the local clock source is not on each motherboard. <coughs> and this, this is simply, this is, is the complete driver, um, except some, um, some uh, init code and some synchronization. Simply, it reads from a register, uh, uh, which is um, uh, 48, no, so 64 bits, which increments at uh, 100 megahertz. No, uh, 200 megahertz, cor sorry, correct. And then um, other parts of the kernel use this, this read function here, which points, po points uh, to the actual uh, driver function, um, which is here. Yeah. Now, the latency of reading this clock is somewhat higher than reading a clock actually in the CPU, but um, clock accuracy is very, very important, so there's no way to, to uh, avoid that. Now, my uh, demo system in, in Norway is down, so I can't show you, but this is HTOP running on our uh, uh, seven server uh, demo system. Now, these, these, each of the green lines here, it's hard to see, but each of them is, is um, HTOP showing the, the CPU load. So I'm running an application here, um, mg, mg.d.x, which is a, a uh, computational test. And um, it's using all the cores. It's written in OpenMP. So it just simply uses threads. And um, OK, so. We get about 34 teraflops from seven AMD Opteron servers. And okay, down here is what, what PS looks like, but of course it's a bit small. Let's see if we can zoom in. Yeah, so th uh, this is HTOP here. And this is what PS would look like. Yeah. So you have lots of uh, threads here running. Actually, um, this shows, shows uh, threads, yeah. So, um, OK, the hardware supports arbitrary configuration. So what you can do is you can get a load of servers, and you can wire them more or less, I wouldn't say randomly, but in a, a, a way which is um, not via the X, Y, and Z 
topology, or, or what's called a torus topology, but you can use arbitrary topology. So in this case, for smaller systems like the one on the previous slides, you can actually use point-to-point uh, point point, uh, configuration. And um, I've, I've written this nice um, uh, JavaScript tool which, which um, you can vary the number of, of servers you have. You can also vary the, the maximum cable length that you, ha you actually have. And it'll, it'll constrain the, the actual wiring. Um, and then it'll generate a, a nice configuration file here, which the firmware will load. Let me, let me just demonstrate, actually. Okay, so here it is, and um, it's showing the wiring topology. Uh, the, the red circles here are, are the servers, and the, the, the lines between them are the cables that you connect. And then, so there's two different representations, and you can highlight a server. So as you're, as you're wiring it with cables, then you can see what goes where. As you adjust the number of servers, it's, it then also adjusts the um, the topology. Since there's only six six ports, then on the adapter, as as you saw earlier, um, if I show you, yeah. So this this has six ports here. So um, of course you can go direct point to point. Um, not on, on everything. Oops. Wait a second. Oops, oops, oops. Yeah, so this is the, the adapter. Now, uh, if I go back to this, um, and then, yeah, okay. And then it also calculates how much cost as well it will, it'll be, and the, the, the inventory list. And then there's a small button here, generate configuration. You click that, and it gives you a config file. Now, um, you have a bunch of servers. Now, how do you manage them from a central point? Well, you have something which I developed in Singapore here, um, which this uh, Numa Manager appliance, this black box here, running um, ARM HF. Um, Ubuntu image, and that that does that gives you a, TF, a TFTP boot server, takes the configuration file you give it, and then it sh gives you a list of your servers, and helps you power on everything together. Uh, yeah, so you can here you can uh, power uh, power on everything, or you can uh, power off reset that kind of thing. So, so that was also something else. So I went to North Carolina uh, a year and a half ago to deploy a um, quite large system with um, 5,000 cores, um, 21 terabyte of memory, um, using, using this uh, interconnect. So we, we ran one of the most popular um, tool benchmarks for measuring total system uh, a performance is called stream. It, it uh, measures um, um, memory bandwidth. And, and we got greater than 10 terabytes a second of uh, uh, DRAM bandwidth from the cores, which, which actually um, is the second, uh, at the point, the second highest world record. There were some kernel patches um, that were done by um, by uh, some guys at SUS, Mel Gorman, which reduced the boot time from uh, two hours to 15 minutes, which was a huge improvement. Previously, the, uh, the DRAM would be initialized from, the, from, from the, the first core. It would mem set all of the DRAM um, in the page tables. And doing that on 
all of the, the uh, DRAM across, um, or across the interconnect was quite slow. So not doing part of it in parallel saved a lot of time. I mean, actually, uh, booting these things in a quarter of an hour is already quick compared to a lot of other uh, systems. The firmware is open source, so it's, it's on GitHub. And let's take a oops, quick peek. Oops, oops, oops. Sorry, guys. GitHub, uh, new scale. Yep, so the firmware here is here. And yeah, um, we have all the source code for actually programming the chip, the registers, all that kind of thing. So everything is here. It's all nicely written uh, and, and, and kind of structured with um, kind of like C++ classes, but then it's all compiled into C, embedded C. So it works nice. And it, it's easier to manage. Yep, so, uh, and then look out for me in the future with my talk on FPGAs um, and deep learning. Any questions? Yes, so, uh, so the idea is, so the idea is this system is to uh, make, uh, uh, take a lot of machines and make it look like uh, one machine to the software or? It's yes, exactly. Part? So it, is, it actually becomes one machine. Mm. So Linux finds all the memory, DRAM cores, all, all the PCI buses. You do LSPCI and you get, you know, in this case you get, um, what, um, 216 uh, trees of your Ethernet, Ethernet cards, disks, every, everything. So it, it's all in one machine. So and what are the practical uses uh, uh, to share, like, uh so what kind of industries use this? So one of the biggest customers uh, right now is uh, SAP. So they have the SAP HANA system for enterprise uh, uh, ERP planning and uh, accounting and things. And that's, that uses big systems. So, uh, so Silicon Graphics, um, half of their sales is selling uh, SAP HANA systems. Also, you get companies uh, and uh, universities doing research, doing uh, with like large databases, and you get um, uh, in-memory databases, so you need lots of local DRAM. And also, if you put your, if you use SSDs, the latency of your your SSDs versus a, a storage area network is so much lower being local. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay. Thanks, guys. <coughs> Thank you, Daniel.